um, several years ago, I visited Birmingham's Museum and Art Gallery, and uh, one thing really struck me, and I took a photo of it at the time, and have kept it ever since, um, and it's called a RUD screen. Now, not RUD as in R-U-D-E, but R-O-O-D. And it struck me because I'd never seen one before and hadn't got a clue what it was. Apparently, it was a common feature of late medieval church architecture. Now, the one I've taken the photo of, this particular RUD screen, it's a very ornate, ornate piece of art, isn't it? It's lovely to look at, very beautiful. But believe it or not, it served a, a rather more sinister purpose. You see, a rude screen is, in very basic terms, a partition. And what purpose did this partition serve? Well, there's a little sign next to this particular rude screen. I don't know if you can read it on the screen. But it explains that this screen separated the churchgoers in the nave, or central part of the church, from the priests in the chancel, the part of the church near the altar. So in other words, it separated the clergy from the ordinary laity, the ordained priests from the common people in the pew. And I think it's a, a visual illustration of the tragedy of life in the Catholic Church during the medieval period. The priests, they're the people with the privilege and the education and the learning, they know Latin, they can read the Bible, they have the anointing of God, and the ordinary people, well, they're in the dark. And they have to hang off the every word of the priest. If you want to hear from God, well, you've got to go through the clergy. Only at specific times, of course. And even when you go to church, there's this partition separating you from these lofty guardians of knowledge. And um, it's a tragedy because it's a denial of the new gospel reality that Paul speaks of in Ephesians 2. If you remember in that famous chapter, Paul, who's writing to Jew and to Gentile, says that Jesus has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. He's talking about this vertical barrier, um, as well as the horizontal barrier, the barrier between God and sinful man, but also the barrier between Jew and Gentile. And Paul is saying that in the New Testament gospel age, all those old distinctions, they just don't matter anymore. All who trust in Jesus Christ, male and female, young and old, rich and poor, they all possess free, full access into God's presence. And Paul is very clear, and, and the rest of Scripture is as well, that it's not an access that can be bought, it can't be earned, it's not something that rich people have or educated people. There is no partition anymore. Jesus has destroyed that partition. And it drew me to the verses I read a few minutes ago in Matthew 27. And in particular, I want to draw your attention to that climatic moment when Jesus paid the penalty for sin and the destruction of that barrier was visually symbolized. So in verse 50... Matthew writes, and when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks split. Now, just it always is interesting to be Matthew's phrase here that Jesus gave up his spirit. Literally, it's he let go his spirit or his breath. And it tells us that not merely that Jesus stopped breathing, but that he voluntarily relinquished his life. Reminds us of what Jesus says of himself in John 10. I lay down my life. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. So when we think about the events of Calvary, they weren't a sort of tragedy, miscarriage of justice, Jesus being taken against his will. Calvary was Jesus knowingly, willingly, freely, gladly laying down his precious life for us, for sinners. And at the very moment that Jesus says, it is finished, and then he stops breathing, something extraordinary happens. The curtain of the temple, 
is torn in two from top to bottom. Now, there were actually two curtains in Herod's temple. One of them separated the sanctuary from the court to which Israelite men were admitted. And then there was this special curtain within the sanctuary itself, which cordoned off the Holy of Holies. And I think Matthew's use of the to refer to the curtain of the temple suggests that this is what he's, he's thinking of here. And I think it's reinforced by the right of the Hebrews. He refers to Jesus entering the inner sanctuary behind the curtain on our behalf. Now, what was the purpose of this veil or or this curtain? Well, it was basically a physical, visible barrier that spoke of God's holiness, God's otherness. From way back in Israel's wilderness days, when there wasn't a temple but there was a tabernacle, even then there was a veil which separated the sanctuary from the Holy of Holies. And it was replicated later in Solomon's temple and then finally again in in the temple that stood when Jesus died, Herod's temple. The Holy of Holies was that special inner sanctum where the awesome presence of the Holy God rested. And nobody could enter that that place except the high priest, Israel's high priest. And he could only enter once a year on the Day of Atonement. And on that day, the high priest would act as the representative of the whole nation, including himself. He'd go in, he'd take the offering behind the veil, and the blood of the offering was sprinkled on the mercy seat, and atonement was made for Israel's sin. Now, even on that solitary visit, there were restrictions. It wasn't as though Aaron or his successor as high priest had 24 hours to just come and go as he pleased, when Aaron or any high priest would burn incense on the altar, the smoke of the incense formed a cloud which concealed the atonement cover of the ark. And it was then that God appeared in the cloud over the atonement cover and the cloud was there to protect Aaron. It protected this human being from the presence of God, a holy God. Because you see, high priest though he was, Aaron, and every successor of Aaron, he he couldn't see God, he couldn't live and see God's presence, because although God was holy, Aaron wasn't. None of his successors were. None of the Israelites were. Yes, they were chosen of God, but they were still guilty sinners before this awesome other God, this, this holy God. And it's true of all of us, isn't it? And it's been the situation from the very moment that Adam and Eve first sinned in the Garden of Eden and were expelled from that garden. If you like, the garden was the very first temple. It was the holy place where God dwelt. And Adam and Eve had sinned. They were now impure, defiled, and they could no longer live to see him. We're told in Genesis 3 that God placed a cherubim with a flaming sword to guard the way back. And I don't think it's a coincidence that when God later on gave instructions for the design of the inner curtain, which protected the Holy of Holies, images of cherubim were woven into it. This is a a very visual, powerful picture, this forbidding curtain, which basically says, God is holy and you are not, keep out, go no further. And this is the the tragedy of the human race, isn't it, really? That we are men and women created in God's image, made for worship, designed for relationship with God, and yet we cannot freely enter his presence because of sin. Sin is the most deadly, the biggest of partitions, isn't it? Sin is the thing that stains us permanently. It makes us unholy, unfit to even look upon a holy God, let alone commune with him. And of course, that's why Jesus came. Christ is the image, we're told, of the invisible God. And he went to Calvary to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Unlike Aaron, and unlike every human high priest, Christ, the great high priest, man and God, was perfect. He was sinless. He had no need to sacrifice for his own sins, because he had none. But he went to sacrifice for our sins, Aaron's sacrifice was limited. It was every year, every year, repeated again and again. 
Jesus's was once for all. Aaron's was just for the Jews, just for Israel. Jesus's is for every tribe and every tongue and every nation, Jew and Gentile, for all who believe in him. No horizontal barriers. And therefore, when Jesus cries, it is finished, and he gives up his spirit and he dies, his work of atonement is completed forever. No more need for any holy of holy curtain or veil. That's why the curtain tears in two. Now, it's quite a remarkable thing. According to the rabbinic literature, the temple curtain was huge. It was 60 feet long, and it was 30 feet wide, apparently as thick as the palm of a man's hand. So if that curtain ever became unclean in some way and had to be washed, you needed 300 priests to do the job. Can you imagine having a curtain that big in your house and trying to do some spring cleaning? Now, perhaps those descriptions are a slight exaggeration, but the point is, this was no flimsy curtain, not the kind that we use in our homes, that can easily tear or wear. And yet Christ's death was so supremely powerful that this huge curtain was torn in two, and not from the bottom up, which would be natural, from the top down. It's the sign, of course, that the Jewish temple was now totally defunct. Jesus had predicted it was going to be destroyed, and this was a foreshadowing of a future tearing. But most importantly, this was the supernatural sign that the way into God's presence that had been strictly limited before was now open, gloriously open, because of Jesus' atoning work. It says in Hebrews 10 that Jesus has opened a new living way through the curtain. It's new because it's a clean break with the old temple rituals and the way of the past, and it's living because it's not dependent upon static codes or rituals or the achievements of long-dead people, it relies on the ever-living, resurrected Jesus. And so, you see, if we're Christians here, if we're clothed in the righteous holiness of Jesus, if our sins have been forgiven and put away as far as east is from west, and they've been placed upon Jesus so that we needn't bear them ourselves, then we may freely regularly, daily, enter through the curtain. Before, there's no way under or through that thick curtain. If you tried to do it, you'd have been put to death. Certain death lay on the other side of that curtain. But now, because that curtain has been torn in two by Christ's death, we can just pass through. Charles Wesley's lovely hymn says, The veil is rent in Christ alone. The living way to heaven is seen. The middle wall is broken down. And all mankind may enter in. Now, over the centuries, many people have tried to put obstacles in that gap. Things like the rude screen. These partitions that say, you need a priest if you're going to come into God's presence. But we don't need priests. You don't need me. You don't need wise people to guide you through we have a great high priest. You know, sometimes as believers, we can erect our own obstacles, can't we? We can wander from God and we can give in to sin. And it says in Isaiah 59 that although our sins have no ultimate condemnatory power, they can separate us from God. Not because he turns his face away from us, not because he retreats into that cloud, but because sin, if you like, is the cloud. Sin clouds our minds and it distorts our thinking and we turn our turn our faces and our minds away from him and yet the wonderful thing to remember is this that for the believer there's always a way back in hebrews 4 16 we're reminded of this aren't we the presence of god is called the throne of grace it's a holy throne it could have been called many things but the writer says it's the throne of grace. Now that's not to deny is it that God, God's presence is awesome. It says in 1 Timothy 6 that this awesome, immortal, invisible God lives in unapproachable light which no one has seen or can see. This is God. 
And it says in Hebrews 10 that it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And yet for the believer who's trusting in God's Son and is wrapped in the holiness of that, that Christ, the fearsome place is the safest place in the world. It's truly a throne of grace where in Jesus, God's unmerited favor to sinners is granted, allowing us to just enter freely and come and, and be who we are, cast our anxieties before him, knowing that he cares for us, seeking him as he is and, and speaking to him and communing with him. And it says in Hebrews 4, 16, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence. In other words, we don't need to skulk in or be embarrassed and think, well, I don't think he'll want to see me. And we can come boldly and confidently so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We're going to be meeting around the Lord's table later. And it's an opportunity, isn't it, to remember and to give thanks for, for those privileges that we have that rest on the finished work of Christ. It's not an achievement of mine that I can come to this table and I can know the living God. It's no achievement of mine at all. It's not an achievement of yours. It's founded on the finished atoning work of Jesus Christ. This is an opportunity for us to give thanks to Jesus, to God for giving us his son. And it's also an opportunity to do what the writer of the Hebrews tells us to do. To approach the throne of grace, yes, reverently, but confidently, boldly, so that we might receive mercy and grace in our time of need. So let, let's do that tonight. Let us approach the throne of grace with confidence as well as with reverence. And as we do, let's praise and thank Jesus that we have this access that people in the Old Testament could only have dreamed of. And we have it in full. What a privilege we have. And it's all because of the death of Jesus Christ for our sins, tearing that dividing barrier in two. Praise him. Amen.